Hello, I'm Connie Walker. Um, for the last few years, I've spent a significant amount of time talking about missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. Uh, the last two seasons of our podcast, Missing and Murdered, focused on the unsolved cases of Alberta Williams and Cleo Semaginis. And all of the stories we've told over the last few years, we tried to tell with great care and with empathy. But today, I want to tell you about the first woman who made me aware of not only the violence that Indigenous women face in Canada, but also issues in the media when covering these stories. I was 16 years old in grade 12, living on a reserve in Treaty 4 territory in southern Saskatchewan, and going to school in Belcaris, a nearby small town, when I first heard about Pamela George. Pamela George was a young Soto woman, a single mother of two, a daughter, a sister. She was also from the Sakame First Nation, not far from where I grew up. She lived in Regina with her young children, and she was killed in 1995. But the two men who were charged with her murder did not go on trial until late the next year. Now, I wasn't a teenager who paid much attention to the news, but I knew about Pamela George. It was a high-profile trial that dominated the headlines in Saskatchewan and even made national news. And as a young First Nations woman who grew up in Saskatchewan, I was keenly aware of the way Pamela was spoken about in the media and how it differed from the way the two white men who were charged in her death were described. Now, here's part of a transcript from a national newscast on December 19th, 90, 1996. You'll have to pretend I'm Peter Mansbridge right now. <clears throat> in Regina, a jury is deciding the fate of two young men charged with the murder of a young woman. It's a case a lot of people are watching closely. The CBC's Eric Sorensen tells us why. The accused are young and clean cut. Steve Comerfield, the basketball star. Alex Chernowetsky, a hockey standout. They come from middle class families. The victim was Aboriginal and a prostitute. The two men admit they were cruising Regina streets one night last year looking for a hooker in this area known for prostitutes. They admitted picking up Pamela George, taking her to a remote roadside, beating her and leaving her behind. This was in January. Her body was found the next morning by police. In court, a friend of the accused testified that Comerfield had told him we drove around, quote, we drove around, got drunk, and killed this chick. And that Chernowetsky told him she deserved it. She was Indian. <sighs> Steve Comerfield, the basketball star, and Alex Chernowetsky, the hockey standout, were acquitted of first-degree murder in Pamela's death and sentenced to manslaughter. At the time, I remember wondering if there were any First Nations journalists in the newsrooms that were covering that trial. And it was the first time that I thought about becoming a journalist. I wanted to help people better understand our people and our communities, to create space so that people could have empathy for Pamela, a young single mother who struggled and occasionally worked in the sex trade to help pay the bills. Turnowetsky and Comerfield both served around four years of jail time and were released on bail around the time I got my first job in a newsroom. I was excited about the impact I could have and my future in journalism, but I quickly realized that having just one voice might not be enough. Back then, it seemed the only time Indigenous stories made the news was when there was a crisis or a conflict. That summer, I was an intern, and the fisheries dispute on the East Coast between the Mi'kmaq people and the non-Indigenous fishermen in Burnt Church, New Brunswick, was making national headlines. My job as an intern was to chase guests for a national morning show. I had booked the chief of the Indian Brook First Nation to come on the show the following Monday to talk about the latest development in the dispute. I was pretty green at that point and frankly not a very good chase producer. Um, but I remember my senior producer at the time grilling me about the details. Did I tell him where to go? She asked. Yes, I said. It was an early morning show, so did I double check with the time? Yes, I said. He knows. And then she said to me, because you know those Indians, they'll go out drinking all weekend and they won't show up on a Monday morning. I remember just looking around to see if anyone else had heard what she had said, but it was a really busy newsroom and no one was paying attention to our conversation. And so 
I didn't know what to say or what to do, so I didn't do anything. I was an intern, what could I say, I thought. A few years later, I was working in a national news program based in Toronto. A young girl, a young woman, who I knew from back home in Saskatchewan had gone missing. This was before social media, before Facebook. Her family had actually sent out an email chain with her picture, asking people to forward it to all of their contacts. Her name was Amber Redman. I knew her because I coached her in volleyball when I was in university. She was the same age as my sister. That same summer, another young woman went missing in Toronto. Her name was Alicia Ross. Amber and Alicia went missing within one month of each other in the summer of 2005. And I remember thinking there were so many similarities between them. They were both young and beautiful. They both had bright futures ahead of them. And they both had families who were desperate for any information about their disappearance. But there were some key differences. Alicia was white and blonde. Her disappearance was covered in the national newspapers and national newscasts. And Amber's disappearance barely got any local coverage. She was indigenous. I wanted to pitch a story that compared and contrasted the attention that these two cases uh, got in the media. And at the time, I worked for a program whose mandate it was to examine the role of media. So I thought my story would be a perfect fit. And I went to pitch to my boss. But before I could really begin, she put up her hand and said, this isn't another poor Indian story, is it? As I grew more experienced, my voice grew stronger. And 10 years later, I was part of a unit at CBC dedicated to helping tell stories about missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls, which led to the creation of our podcast, Missing and Murdered. Finally, I had the time and space and resources to be able to tell stories about the violence that Indigenous women and girls face in Canada in a way that could address the harmful stereotypes that I'd encountered my, in my entire career. Space to explore the context, to show how these stories are connected back to our shared history that not enough people are aware of. As journalists and as consumers of journalism, we need to realize how Indigenous people have been misrepresented and underrepresented in mainstream media for decades. Things are changing, yes, but there are still so many widely held stereotypes and harmful tropes that we need to confront. I think of Pamela George. What could we have better understood about her story if we had looked beyond her being a sex worker, if we had approached her story with empathy? In the last season of Missing and Murdered, Finding Cleo, we used the central mystery of Cleo's story to help people understand the 60 scoop, the overrepresentation of Indigenous kids in care, the legacy of residential schools, because we knew that part of understanding Cleo's story would be understanding her mother Lillian's story. Lillian was a woman who had all six of her children taken by child welfare authorities a woman who was also taken away from her family and community as a child and sent to a residential school. Lillian struggled with addiction, she struggled with the trauma that she experienced, and she struggled to, to take care of her children. And when we started the podcast, we knew that to do justice to Cleo's story and to her mother's story, we needed to create space for people to have empathy for Lillian, to help people fully understand her story. And by using the popularity of podcasts and the true crime genre, we were able to reach people who didn't even know that they were interested in Indigenous issues. People who came for the mystery, but stayed to learn about Canadian history. People who went on to have empathy for Cleo and for Lillian, and people who, if they heard Pamela's story now, would demand the same for her. Thank you.